Do we have too much government? We need to put uh, people in ahead of corporate profits. This system is so lopsided. This threat is a real threat to democracy. And I think that's really important. That's something we haven't been doing in this country for a long time. Where do you start? What do you do? How do you do it? Access to Democracy and other Egan Community Television programming is supported by Thomson Reuters, makers of Westlaw Next and based in Egan. Through Westlaw Next and other innovative online services, Thomson Reuters is the world's leading source of intelligent information for businesses and professionals. Online at ThomsonReuters.com and by U.S. Federal Credit Union the member-owned financial institution offering service, value, and experience you can trust to the greater Twin Cities community. Welcome. We return with Access to Democracy. And we return with a returning guest. Uh, always a pleasure to have Matt and Tenza here, uh, a fountainhead of knowledge. And he brought with us a guest today who's hiding behind the cameras, Labuda from the BBC, and welcome to you. Uh, if she was on camera, maybe she'd tell us about uh, how Mitt Romney embarrassed the whole world over in England. But uh, we won't go into that today. Matt, you've been here a lot of times over the years, probably pushing a dozen, I would say. Well, you know, this is one of the premier public affairs shows on TV, and as one of the founders and board members of Minnesota 2020, this show is one of the most important places that actually has real substantive discussions about what we should do with our state. So I'm pleased to be back here with you, Alan. Well, I, you read that just the way uh, <laughs> I wrote it, and <laughs> I appreciate that. But, you know, talking about the fact that uh, you do a lot of television. You just came here from taping Tom Hauser's Sunday show. Well, so we're fortunate that the Twin Cities is still a place where there's a lot of interest in public affairs. And of course, TPT does some good shows. Uh, Channel 5 and the uh, Hubbard family are very committed to public affairs. And so uh, Tom Hauser has his show on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock. And I'm lucky enough to be a guest there fairly frequently. Uh, but I'm always very happy uh, to be here in Egan and to be working with you. Uh, because we've got so many issues and so many positive things that we can do to build up the state, but we need to be focused on them and not distracted because in public policy there's a lot of distractions and then there's real things that make Minnesota work. And at Minnesota 2020, and I'd urge your uh, viewers to take a look at mn2020.org, uh, Minnesota 2020 is a place, it's a forum to have that discussion about how to move Minnesota forward, how to make Minnesota the great place that it can be. And if they go to my website, there's a link uh, to Minnesota 2020, and you can link right on. Uh, I certainly <coughs> look forward uh, to the variety of areas that you cover with some really, really good fellows and interns and reporters, and uh, uh, I don't know how you arrive at the <laughs> designations, but uh, you have, you know, just a fascinating lineup of people. Con well, we've Conrad we've DeFibra, uh, who we got? Lee, Lee Eggerstrom is there, longtime reporter for the Pioneer yeah. Press. Conrad, who you mentioned, of course, with the Minneapolis Star Tribune for many, many years. Uh, we have stars that have come out of the uh, Humphrey Institute, like uh, Will Nissen, who's doing work yeah. for us on energy-related issues now. You know, it's, it's interesting because in driving down here today, I was thinking how great it would be if we could think back to the 1950s uh, because you know we don't want to learn the lessons of history when the Twin Cities had one of the finest light rail systems in the entire world. You could go from White Bear Lake all the way to Lake Minnetonka on a train uh, that was affordable, that was well run. Uh, everyone didn't have to hop in a car. Uh, we had fewer pollution issues. And now we're trying to build back to that. And Conrad DeFibri at Minnesota 2020, who was a, did a lot of work on transportation with the Minneapolis Star Tribune, has released a series of great reports about how we can get back to that again. And for those of us in the uh, southern suburbs of the Twin Cities, you know, we should have rail and bus lines, dedicated bus lines that run down uh, Cedar Avenue. We actually had trolley lines also, yeah. Yeah. because my parents moved here in 51. And uh, 
So Christmas vacation, I came to visit them from college in Syracuse. And I stepped off uh, out of the uh, train station onto a streetcar and uh, 24 below zero, <laughs> got off at the uh, wrong stop, uh, lugging a suitcase, and managed to get frostbite between there and when I got to my parents' home. But uh, yeah, but it was a great system. Mm -hmm. And it took you every place. And of course, we've lost all of that. Well, we had that infrastructure <coughs> built. It was lost uh, in the belief that somehow cars would solve all of our problems. And of course, you only have to drive on 35E, 494, 94 to know we can keep ex trying to expand highways. And not only is it very expensive, and people should know every single day we're subsidizing our highways. It costs a lot of money uh, to pay for highways. And the gas tax pays for a portion of it, but not for all of it. So our property tax dollars and Egan and Burnsville and this entire region are paying for those things. And what we need is a mix because our highways are choked. Uh, if the economy takes off again, they'll get even more choked. And that's why we need to have light rail and heavy rail and other points of access. And at Minnesota 2020, we're trying to have the discussion about how do we do that in a fiscally responsible way? How do we have a balanced transportation program that means that when as the economy goes, our companies can grow and people say, you know, we don't want to bother with the Twin Cities because of the traffic, because our traffic problems uh, have gotten worse and worse over the years. And you keep these issues in front of the people by a series of very good articles, as I said, by some really, really expert people. And transportation uh, is certainly one of them. I, I can recall going back a dozen years, we had a legislator, uh, then governor, by the name of Palenti sitting where you are, and uh, possibly soon to be vice presidential candidate. And I was much in favor of light rail, having lived in several places where it really worked. Uh, he was opposed to it. And yet, when it, uh, when it opened, uh, the first day. He cut the ribbon. I wasn't invited, but uh, it has proved to be so successful, the Hiawatha line. Uh, and now, of course, we're expanding to St. Paul. Uh, we have the North Star, uh, which and at it, least is and something. I th and I think we're going to see an expansion now <coughs> down to the southwest, down to Eden Prairie, uh, that will uh, there's a couple different potential orientations, but we need some things in other parts of the South Metro. And I think Governor Pliny, who certainly was not interested at all in light rail, came around to it, in part because what he heard from the business community is we need more transportation options. Let me tell you about something very exciting. Um, one of our fellows at Minnesota 2020 is an Egan resident um, named Salman Mehta, uh, who's an engineer, an expert on these issues. Salman wrote a fabulous report that people can find on our Minnesota 2020 archives, because it's not just about rail. Uh, rail's expensive, it makes sense on the high density corridors. Uh, but we can learn from an experience that uh, Google has had in San Francisco. There you have large employers, and Thomson Reuters is a great example of that, and they'll run dedicated buses, and instead of buses all going to the city center, downtown St. Paul, downtown Minneapolis, and then out from there, they'll run buses that run through uh, areas, pick people up, and then bring them to major employers. And Google actually built their own private transportation network in San Francisco, and we should partner with major employers like 3M, uh, like Thomson Reuters and others, because on those buses, you drop in a wireless network and all of a sudden when people are to and from on their way to work instead of being stuck in traffic and there they are feeling all you know tense and not getting anything done they can get the email work done they can get some of their shopping done and they can get their work work done and be more productive employees and increasingly large employers are recognizing that mass transit is part of the solution to help relieve some of the stress their employees have in getting to work and in being more productive in their personal lives and in their work lives. And it is a different world today, and we really have to get used to it. Uh, certainly a generational thing with me, as I just had one of my students helping me with my Android because <laughs> it was a mystery to me. Uh, but yes, we have to get into where we are because where we are is obsolete six months from now, and uh, things are evolving so quickly. Uh, that it's difficult to really stay on top of them. And one of the key issues with transportation is this. What some people argue is they'll say, well, we can't afford rail because we have to subsidize it. And that's true. Uh, the cost of rail is more expensive than the ticket price that people pay. But what the critics fail to notice is we subsidize roads as well. 
all forms of transportation have a subsidy, subsidized through tax dollars, because the alternative would be we'd have to build our own roads, we'd have to pay for our own transportation costs completely uh, out of pocket, and that's not possible. So as a society, we allocate money through roads, through property tax monies and gas tax. Likewise, we help subsidize trains and we help subsidize light rail and buses. And the key thing is having that mix of things so that our economy can move, people can get to work, goods can move about. And that's a good thing because the alternative would be gridlock. And in uh, countries that haven't invested in their road infrastructure, and their train infrastructure, you see economies that can't grow, wages that don't grow, and most importantly, opportunities that are lost. And we need to keep those opportunities for the great companies we have here in Minnesota. Uh, as you were talking about that, uh, one of the things that really troubles me about politics as it is now, uh, President Obama just this week said to small business owners, you didn't do it yourself mm -hmm. as part of indicating that it's these roads and it's the infrastructure and it's telephone and it's Wi-Fi and it's all these things that enable people to do things. Well, Karl Rove immediately took yeah. one sentence out of context and used as an, as an ad. Uh, the truth seems to be a dying commodity. We certainly saw it, and, and probably the most frightening example is Michelle Bachman McCarthy, uh, the McCarthy being a reference to Joe McCarthy and what she did to Muslims this week, uh, which is just frightening and, and really a throwback for me to World War II, where vilification of, of whole classes of people uh, went almost, well, it, it almost caused the end of the world as we know it. Uh, how can we fight in the political realm mistruths and untruths? Well, unfortunately, politics is increasingly a game about speed, accusations, uh, sometimes smears, uh, attempting to throw opponents off balance, and being a lot less concerned about the truth of things and whether or not gotcha is going to work. And at Minnesota 2020, Minnesota 2020 is a nonpartisan organization. It, it has a, a progressive uh, tilt to it, but ruthlessly nonpartisan, because we believe that good public policy that's well explained, well researched, uh, that's based on what's going to work to grow Minnesota's economy, our transportation, our education, and health care, those are the things that bring Minnesota together and make for a great state. And it's really sad to see. For example, President Obama made a completely fair point. His point was not that entrepreneurs don't work hard, not that entrepreneurs don't deserve uh, success, but that none of us do it alone. The reality is when you get up in the morning, you don't make sure that the water is clean in your shower so you don't have to worry about getting some communicable disease. You don't worry about the fact that if you slip and fall, that there isn't going to be an ambulance and firefighters there to step in and make sure that there's someone there to take care of you. Likewise, our hospitals uh, are there. All of those are things that get public services and, of course, the roads that would get you to that hospital. The police that will help you if your home is broken in. And as a business, you need employees for most businesses unless you're just a sole proprietor. And you need employees who can read, who can do math, who have the ability to communicate uh, what your business wants to do, and that means public education. But even if you're a sole proprietor, you still have to get to your place of business. Yeah. You still have to use a lot of facilities. You still want to know that there's an electric grid that's going to allow you to turn on your lights. You want to be able to communicate to suppliers. Uh, there is nobody, as the president said, who has done it alone. And to see his words distorted really unfairly like that is really, really distressing. Not surprising coming from Karl Rove, but distressing. Yeah, and you know, <coughs> sadly, you know, both sides will occasionally engage in this. We've seen a lot of it from Karl Rove and his ilk. And that's what turns people off on public policy and politics. So that's why I'd encourage folks to take a look at Minnesota 2020. Um, MN2020.org is the website. And the goal there is to have a discussion of public policy that's not rooted in personalities. So when Michelle Bachman accuses Keith Ellison of, of somehow being part of terrorism uh, or being part of organizations linked with terrorism, which is something she made up as she got up in the morning. Um, Keith Ellison is a great American. And the fact that he's a Muslim is a great example of what a great society we have, that you yeah, can be Jewish. One of, one of our favorite guests here. Yeah. There are times when Keith is in here, and if he's the last guest of the day, as he usually is, uh, our half hour suddenly comes up and he says, 
let's keep going. Yeah. And we, we end up doing an hour. And, uh, well, and one of the great things uh, that it says about America, uh, after Keith was elected to Congress, as the first Muslim ever elected in the history of the United States to the United States Congress, Condoleezza Rice, Republican Secretary of State, personally called him up and asked if he would join the State Department in a delegation to the Middle East, an area where there's huge conflict and where there's a lot of distrust of the United States. And she, as George Bush, the Secretary of State, said, I want to make sure that people see that in the United States that we're a country where if you're Jewish, if you're Christian, if you're Muslim, you have opportunities, we're an open country, you can have success. And so she got that. George Bush's Secretary of State got that. What Michelle Bachman is doing is running around pointing fingers and accusing people of being allied with organizations that she believes are part of terrorism and tearing people down just because of their uh, religious beliefs. And that's not what built this country. And at Minnesota 2020, what we're trying, our argument is, let's get away from the politics of gotcha, the politics of tearing people apart. Let's focus on the things that really make a state great. How are we gonna have a great state? We believe it's because you have sustainable environmental policies that create great schools, have good economic development, have health care that's affordable and accessible, and that has transportation so people can get to work and can do the things that they need to do so that they can lead a great life. When we focus on those things as opposed to tearing one another apart, we build a great state and a great country. We also need a legislature in this state that puts a priority on education. Yeah. Uh, now, for instance, the tuition that our interns are paying has gone up and up and up. In some cases, it makes it impossible for them to continue school. They take a year off to have to earn the money. Sometimes they don't come back. Uh, we're really losing in that regard, and the state is losing in that regard. We have borrowed billions from our uh, K through 12 schools that hasn't been paid back and there are people who are using textbooks that are 30 years old in science well has science changed in 30 years science has changed in the last six months we can't have that in minnesota we shouldn't have that in minnesota well minnesota 2020 has a whole series of reports in education and uh, once again i encourage folks to go to mn20 mn2020.org and take a look at uh, some of these positive reports about how we can make our schools work better because a high quality workforce, every employer will tell you, is the key to a business being successful. You have to have an entrepreneur, you have to have someone with a good idea, you have to have some capital behind it, but at the end of the day, if you don't have high quality employees, and ideally customers who also can understand what the you know, value is of the business and why they should want to do business with it, it can't be successful. So one of the issues we tackled early on at Minnesota 2020 is, why do we lose half of our teachers in the first five years? I mean, it's a, tremendous rate of loss. People who have gotten a lot of education, people who made a commitment to teaching our young people, we lose half of them. And what we discovered was it's because new teachers don't get support, they get overwhelmed, they're in a classroom with 30, 35, 40 kids, which I admit I couldn't make it in a classroom with 40 kids if you drop me in there and I've raised three sons. And there are some great uh, systems that have been put together by uh, Minnesota State University at Mankato that showed with some support, with helping move them back and forth earlier in and out of uh, schools while they do their teacher training, we can cut that in half. Because teaching is not for everybody, but it is a waste of our resources and a, a, a real disrespect to the energy that these young folks are putting into education, into our kids, to not support our teachers. And instead, as you know... And we don't we pay them, really, yeah. in terms of what their worth is. And then they get really uh, attacked because they're in a union. Uh, I mean, we saw what happened in Wisconsin. Unions are not the bugaboo of this society. It's people who are making excessive amounts of money and are not willing to pay their fair share and or who utilize that or who offshore, and certainly we have a presidential candidate who is the poster boy for offshoring. Uh, those are the things that really, really are taking away from the quality of life that we had. Well, it's about priorities. You know, what are our priorities? And being clear about our priorities. So if people think about their family budget, you know, one of your top priorities, of course, is making sure you're putting money into enough food for everyone in the household, that you're putting money into making sure that the mortgage is paid or your rent is paid so you've got a place to live, uh, sorting out your transportation, that's a car payment or a bus pass or whatever it is. So if you think about the state of Minnesota, where are our priorities? As a parent, I can tell you our top priorities have to be the next generation. 
Uh, we need to make sure that they're well educated. We need to make sure that they're doing well. If our schools don't work well, if we don't, if the next generation is not educated, when I'm older, who's going to take care of me in the nursing home? Uh, who's going to make sure that uh, the economy is doing well so that uh, those services that I'm going to need, health care and otherwise, are going to be available when I'm older? That's, it's selfish on the one hand, but schools to me are my social security. Schools were my leg up coming from a poor family where I lost my father, so I, I was think able to do story, well. I think your story, and let's relate it briefly, because your story is, is really, uh, really, really something to be proud of and to indicate what can be done with the proper help. Well, I, I think I'm an example, and there's so many people who are good examples out there, you know. Your father died, and we, you were really from a small community. Yeah, I'm, I'm from Worthington, Minnesota, down in southwest Minnesota. Uh, very sadly, we lost my father to alcoholism uh, when I was 15, uh, and he left our family is what happened. And uh, as a result, we lost our home. Um, and fortunately, my grandmother, uh, who did not count on uh, three grandkids and her daughter moving back in, was able to take us back in. But I had such a great supportive community in Worthington, a community that gave me a high quality education, a state that believed that a kid with a name like Intenza, and let's face it, Intenza is not some famous name. I'm not a Mondale or even a Johnson or an Anderson. Um, you know, I might be Norwegian, but I've got a, got a funny last name. But I got that opportunity of a strong education, which allowed me to go on to go to the U eventually to go to law school to become a criminal prosecutor, to be a legislator, to have an opportunity to try and give back to a state that gave so much to me. And it pains me deeply when I look at our public schools, and as you referenced earlier, we have taken $1.8 billion out of our public schools and told them, we might pay you back, maybe we won't pay you back. And uh, instead of saying, you know what, we're going to create a budget, those of us who've done well will pay our fair share, and instead we're robbing education. And that's, that's showing that we don't have the right priorities. And that's one of the big problems that's facing us. What do you see as the biggest problem facing us in Minnesota this year with the election? Well, <coughs> no me. question. With the economy being what it is, uh, the key thing is how are we going to create jobs? Uh, how are we going to get the economy going? The long-term answer with how you create jobs is investment in education. Uh, the second thing you have to do is you have to have a strategy to help create jobs. And at Minnesota 2020, uh, we believe that one of those key areas is energy. Um, that in, if we start paying ourselves for our energy as opposed to paying people in Saudi Arabia for our energy, we keep that money here and that's money that then helps fuel our economy. So it makes sense that rather than uh, you know, spending more money on oil and putting gasoline in our cars, we should be moving towards the next generation of ethanol. Ethanol is a billion dollar industry, but now we need a new generation of ethanol that instead of being based on corn, is based on other products. And uh, we've studied some great examples at Minnesota 2020 of new ways of getting ethanol and biodiesel that would come from Minnesota fields and Minnesota farms. So they'd grow, for example, uh, one crop uh, early in the spring that could be used to create biodiesel fuel and there's a project came out of Augsburg College uh, that is doing exactly that up in Isandy, Minnesota. And then after that, then they can grow a food crop like corn. So our farmers would make more money, we'd keep our fuel dollars here, we'd create Minnesota-based industries, and that's the way to help grow the, the economy, and that's something that we can do right here and right now. To say nothing of wind power and solar. Absolutely. Uh, both of which we have in great quantity here. Uh, I'm not talking about the wind that comes out of the legislature. I'm talking <laughs> about what's out in western Minnesota. And uh, speaking of the legislature, though, what did they accomplish this last session? Virtually nothing, except that they put, to me at least, two unnecessary constitutional amendments on the ballot. Mm. Millions of dollars have been spent on something that's a non-issue. Yeah, this is the politics of divisiveness and sort of gotcha politics. At Minnesota 2020, our belief is that the most important thing is that we're trying to pull people together and move the state forward. Hence our focus on things like education, focus on economic development, transportation. These constitutional amendments are not div uh, designed to bring us together, they're designed to divide us. Um, and while it's certainly fair that people are going to have opinions uh, about marriage, I personally hope this constitutional amendment fails because I don't see why government should get in the way of people's freedom to make choices. That being said, 
People are going to have differences of opinion, but is this really where we want to put our time? Is this really where we want millions and millions of dollars to go in our energy? Instead of saying, let's bring people together, Republicans and Democrats, and let's focus on making sure that Minnesota schools are the best in the world. To make sure that a kid who's growing up in Egan has all the opportunities that I had growing up, rich family or poor family, to have opportunities for success and to raise kids and then grandkids. And these amendments are mean-spirited, and they're designed and said to make it harder for people uh, to come together, and they're about pulling harder people apart. Harder for people to vote when we should be making it easier for people to vote when we have finally a Secretary of State who really is pledged to making it easier for people to vote, and then we have legislators who are trying to keep people away from the polls. Senseless to me, uh, certainly anti-American to me. Uh, against everything that we stand for. Well, and I th you raise a really important issue because there's been a lot of attention on the issue of uh, the the ban on the right uh, and the freedom of people who happen to be gay or lesbian to get married. Um, the issue about voter ID has gotten a lot less attention. And at first blush, a lot of folks say, well, it doesn't seem like such a big deal to have to present a driver's license if you want to vote. But I think of my grandmother uh, before she passed. Her last 10 years, she didn't have a driver's license. She was perfectly capable of voting. Uh, she was in a nursing home, and she would vote at the uh, nursing home. She wouldn't have been able to vote if she had to have a driver's license. My mother and my mother-in-law, the same yeah. situation. And you have uh, tens of thousands of other people. And the Secretary of State, uh, Mark Ritchie, who's done an excellent job, has come out against this amendment, uh, as have many other national leaders. Because for which he's been pilloried and attacked. Yeah, because they've recognized that this is one of those things that on its face looks good, but in reality is going to disenfranchise older people, will disenfranchise many younger people who don't drive and use the bus. And while, yes, it is theoretically possible for people to get a state ID, the reality is, is a lot of people don't have any need for that state ID, and when it comes to election day, they'll realize, oops, I guess I can't vote. And our soldiers overseas as well. Yeah. Absolutely. It's putting a, their lives on the line mm -hmm. and yet being inhibited from voting. I mean, it, yeah. it makes just no sense to me at all. And that's why we've seen a lot of uh, veterans and we've seen a lot of people who are involved with the military also say this is a bad idea. So I hope folks take a look at this issue and say, you know what, rather than spending our time monkeying around with the Constitution, just say no. Let's leave the Constitution alone and let's focus on positive ways of working together and making sure that Minnesota is as great as it can be. And uh, it is always a pleasure and a learning experience <laughs> to talk to Matt and Tenza. Uh, actually, we've been fortunate enough to have you here twice this year. Uh, normally, we see you about once a year. But uh, if you didn't get the impression that Matt is with Minnesota 2020, <laughs> which he might have mentioned once or twice during this interview, uh, mm -hmm. that is certainly a place to go for impartial information and you can get it on my website as well as just going to minnesota2020.org uh, matt always a pleasure uh, thanks so much and uh, hope to see you soon very good thank you very much alan thank you.